Uh, my name is Peter. I work for Styra. I'm the community advocate for the Open Policy Agent Project. My name is Rita Zhang. Uh, I'm a maintainer of the OPA Gatekeeper Project. Awesome. And yeah, curious, uh, quick show of hands. Who here is already using OPA? A couple people. How many people are using Gatekeeper? Specifically, all right, couple people. Who's brand new to OPA and like policy as code? Oh. Excellent. A okay. lot of new folks. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why I asked the question. I wanted to understand uh, where we should start this. Luckily, we have a few uh, intro slides, kind of talk about the project, uh, problems we're trying to solve, and the direction we're going. So, with that, let's get started. Today's uh, today's agenda here. We're going to do a little intro of the Open Policy Agent project. Uh, then we're going to talk about the updates that have come out over the last like six months, and then I'll hand it over to Rita, who's going to do the same for the gatekeeper specific stuff, and we'll talk about uh, how gatekeeper uh, is has has OPA and Rego under the hood. Cool. All right. So open policy agent. Quick introduction. Uh, OPA is a open source general purpose policy engine. It graduated. It's a graduated project for in the CNCF as of 2021. Uh, we are looking at the problem as a unified tool set and framework across your entire stack. That means that we're going to be able to uh, implement policy as code features with any of the tools and services that you want to uh, uh, in, uh, that, that you are using in your stack. Right. This works by decoupling the policy from your application logic so that the decision point happens next to uh, these services, not inside of it. Uh, and then we'll get into Rego and stuff in a little bit. A little bit about the community and numbers, right? We've had over 300 contributors to the project. We have 85 integrations in our ecosystem already. These integrations are tools that people have built around OPA or on top of OPA that are in, this, in the ecosystem for, for community members to pick up. These are going to help you do uh, specific things like working with Service Mesh, working with API gateways, working with the other tools that you have. Uh, Community members have solved a lot of these problems, so it's going to be very helpful to uh, work on top of what other community members have already done. Right? We have a good number of uh, GitHub stars and an active Slack community. We have about 6,400 members in the Slack, uh, so getting questions answered is uh, fairly easy. Uh, we have a good number of downloads. We also have some popular uh, tools such as ConfTest for working with configuration data and tools like Gatekeeper for working with Kubernetes and admission controller. Also some like fun IDE plugins for uh, uh, VS Code, IntelliJ, if you're a Vim user, we have uh, syntax highlighting and a bunch of stuff to make policy authoring nice and easy. Uh, so how does it work, right? The policy decision uh, model, right? Essentially like this, as I stated, this is going to be a, a universal policy tool and framework. It's going to take all of the different uh, languages that you want to write in, all the different infrastructure tools, the different clouds you want to use, and it's going to allow you to have a centralized uh, policy tool to work with all of them. And so this is a very easy uh, 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 diagram that we have on our docs. It shows you that the service that you want is going to sit at the top. OPA is going to sit next to it. You're going to pass in a JSON object. Right, this JSON object is going to come out of your services. You're going to take uh, um, the information. It could be JWT tokens, user info, whatever you want. You're going to package this up as a JSON object uh, and hand that to OPA. OPA is going to look at this information and return what is a decision. Very simply, this decision could be a yes-no Boolean. This decision could also contain more information. Right, You could pass data in like a JWT token and pass back uh, a security answer. Right? So you're going to be returning uh, information as a JSON object. Right? And so that, that uh, return decision happens by, uh, with the input data, we're going to take that, compare it to the policy that you've defined. Right? And this policy is going to state uh, the intent that you want. Right? This policy is going to be written in Rego, which we'll cover in a second. And then any, any, any data objects that you want to connect to. Right? You may be storing data from your LDAP server, your SSO, any sort of... Um, uh, database information, if you're just collecting stats or metrics, right? You can compare this information to the request that you're sending from the service, right? So now you have a, a, a three part, uh, a, a three part, three parts to this decision model where you have data, you have your policy, what is going to happen, and you have the input data from your service, right? And that's going to give you that decision that you return to the service so it knows how to behave and how to perform given this request. Um, more services. Uh, so with Rego, Rego here is the coding language that it comes with OPA. 
Regal is a purpose-built policy language, right? And so it is a, it was purposely built for, for defining how your policy should look for your services, right? And so we decided to build something from the ground up. We tried uh, to use various things. We tried to use Golang. We tried to use JavaScript. We tried to like compare how it would look to define policy with existing tools. And we found that the amount of infrastructure you have to build around those languages ends up making the trade-off not great, right? So we started from the ground up. We built a language called Rego, and this language is a declarative policy language. So that just means that declarative, you want to state the intent of your policy. You want to state the outcome that you expect, and Rego is going to figure out how to take the input and create that output. You don't have to do the imperative approach where you go line by line and do the conversion. Instead, you just define what you want at the end, and Rego figures out how to get there. Much like if you're using uh, HashiCorp, HCL language for like Terraform or something, right? That, so you can think of that as like a declarative language, or it is a declarative language, so you can make the comparisons there. Uh, let's see. Uh, right, and so with, with Rego, uh, we have a policy which is going to consist of rules. So a policy is going to be a set or a package of these rules. Each one of these rules, uh, which may be layered on top of each other, you may have something like an allow rule, which is very popular to say, like, allow if, right, X number of things are, are valid, right? So you do, you'll do all of your checks. The opposite side of that is something that's very popular, like with the gatekeeper uh, uh, side of things, where you do a deny list. You give all the reasons you want to deny an action, deny a set of, of things to happen, and then you create those error messages from that deny list, right? And so now you just stack all of the, all of the things that you want to check for, and at the end state, uh, and, and how you want that to look at the end state. <laughs> uh, all of this is well documented. We have pages and pages of docs for each specific thing. You can check, us, check out the docs at openpolicyagent uh, slash docs. You can also give it a try at play.openpolicyagent.org. This is our playground. Uh, this is going to allow you to bring your own data input that you want to check. If you have a service that you're already using, you can take that data out. You can use it as an input object and then play around and create a couple of Rego rules to see how you can transform that, that data into a decision, right? So that is a very good tool from our community. Uh, and, and it's a tool that we use heavily in the community as well for troubleshooting, as well as communicating uh, uh, things that we want to work on. If you are working on uh, an interesting problem, you have an interesting data set, you can drop all that information into the playground, and you can create a share link and hand that to another community member or another team member. And that's going to show you how the coverage of your data and the policy are going to look in real time, right? So it's, a very, it's an interactive tool that is very helpful for getting started. And so with that, that is just like a high level intro. Um, now we're gonna get into the project updates, right? So this, this is now things that have changed. Uh, we did a last, our last update was in Valencia. So it's a, I'm gonna cover a couple of the language changes uh, that have not been heavily adopted yet. Uh, and so I'm going to cover a couple of those again, uh, and then as well as the new things that have come out in the last six months. And Rita will cover the same thing for the gatekeeper side. So uh, as a declarative language, right, we uh, try our best to make, these, uh, to make the language as human readable as possible. Right? When you're declaring intent, it becomes, uh, uh, becomes crucial that your, your policies are, are human readable. Right? You want people to understand what is happening. Uh, as they're reading and writing, it, it makes the process much easier. So we've introduced some new keywords. The first one that's, that's, that's here is in, right? So now instead of uh, creating a loop around a set of data, around a set of arrays, around uh, 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 in, in any sort of uh, objects, right? As you can see, this is how we were doing it uh, previously. The previous way still works. So if you have existing policies, you can still use them. Uh, but that bracket at the end is going to be how you loop through uh, a list or an array or a set and so now what we've done is to make this, make this more readable, you can just use the in keyword. So now, if you're looking for something in this set, you can just drop in the in keyword. And so partnered with this, we have um, a way to create uh, variables, right? And so now uh, we can create a variable. Before, what we used to do is to have this, this value, uh, and then we have this value that we create, we assign that to a key, and then you would, you would use those variables. Now, what we were doing instead is to do this sum word. That sum word says that we're now working with a set of data. Here's the keys and values. Extract them from this object, right? And so now you can see that this is just 
a simpler way for someone who may not be a regular writer to understand what is happening with that object and how we're using those variables. We also, we also, in, uh, we also used uh, the if keyword, and so this is one that caused a little bit of confusion in the community because people uh, thought that we were introducing a new logic. The if keyword is actually just a little bit of syntactic sugar. Right? With the previous method, you can see that we are, are saying allow equals true uh, if this body is equal to true. Right? And so it's a little bit abstracted. Now you can just streamline it, allow if true. Right? And so this is just an easier way, a little bit syntactic sugar, make things uh, nice and clean. We also have the contains keyword now. So this partners with the if keyword. Uh, there is a, uh, when, you are, when you are writing a rule, we have one, one style of creating a list. You might create a list of deny reasons. Right? This is going to be called a partial rule because it doesn't have an exact answer. It's going to collect a bunch of answers and put them into an object for you. And then you can call that object as part of like, the data transformation for the decision. Right, so you might have a list of deny rules. Right, and so this is what we're going to use the contains word for. Uh, previously, you can see uh, we're collecting a bunch of errors from the input and then shoving them into a list called errors. Now you can use the contains keyword errors contains uh, ERR if, uh, if that exists, and then that inputs it into the, into the uh, uh, partial set. Uh, last one here I think I have is the every keyword. So uh, once again, uh, we have the old style here. We are doing a comprehension, which looks a bit complicated because it is a little bit complicated. You see uh, internal containers, and then we have this string here, right? The string at the end is essentially collecting, all, looping through all of the containers and looking for things that start with that Acne Corp uh, list and then putting that into the, the initial variable that we created there. Right? And so now, instead, what we can do is just uh, loop through that list, create a variable called container, and then, and then do that check. Uh, da, da, da. Another update to come out is, this, uh, is metadata. We needed a way to um, have, have a more, uh, uh, so a little bit more than comments, right? These, uh, the metadata here is actually going to allow you to comment and annotate your rules, and then you're able to actually call this information as well. So instead of just uh, making a comment that tells your developers uh, what you expect to happen here, now you can actually have things in there uh, that are callable. On the second slide here, you can see that we are doing the annotation.custom.severity, and so we're actually pulling out the, the, the annotation metadata and pulling that into our policy itself so that you can reuse this information uh, for, 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 for various rules inside of your policies. Uh, uh, there's, this, is not a full, this is not a full list of the annotations available. This is just a small subset. Uh, so check out the, the docs if you want to see the other available uh, um, annotations that we have. Cool. The next one up here is we developed a um, GraphQL built-in. You could have done this previously before uh, but th there was a lot more uh, manual, manual steps to work with the data. Now what you're able to do is use our GraphQL uh, built-in to kind of kind of walk the, the structure tree of that GraphQL query. Uh, and things like this pop up uh, due to community demand. So if there are tools that you're working with that we have not built uh, built-ins for, I think we have about 150 built-ins so far for different tools that community members are using. So if you're using something and it's hard to work with that data, let us know, write a PR, and write, we can figure out if there's a need for it in the community, and then build the tools around it so that we can make your jobs as policy authors much easier. Other new things, uh, some more new than others. Uh, the newest one on this list is uh, ND built-in cache. Uh, with ND built-in cache, this is going to allow you to have better decision logs. The decision log is the log of decisions, obviously, right? And so, so these decisions are every decision that OPA has made uh, to say, I'm allowing this thing, I'm denying this thing, and why these things happen. Uh, one thing that we noticed, though, is that for specific uh, built-in rules that have non-deterministic values, we don't know what the value of random is going to be. This did not get logged very well. That made troubleshooting very hard, 
So now with this uh, ND built-in cache, we're actually taking this information and letting you know that we did, not, uh, we did not know what the outcome was going to be beforehand and give you a little bit more information so that when you are troubleshooting, you can trace that back and say, why did this HTTP, HTTP call make the uh, outcome that it did? Uh, Delta bundles is the ability to uh, take your bundle of policy and data and update it in place without having to replace the entire policy. Disk storage is if you are working with a large data set. Um, typically, when you are working with data, OPA is going to store all of that data in memory. Right? This makes it very performant, very quick to come to these decisions. But that comes with a memory overhead. And so if, you have a, if you're working with gigs of policy data, Right, there, there's about a, if you're working with like hundreds of megabytes, you'll end up with gigs of memory, right? We have about a, I think it's like a 20X uh, cost there. So disk storage allows you to store a lot of these policies on disk and access it. Uh, not as performant as in memory, but if you are working with a large data set, it's very helpful. Function mocking, um, this, was, this was a community request, people asking for, they've written a lot of custom functions and they wanna be able to replicate that data. Uh, or replicate that ability uh, for, for testing. Strict mode is for all of the new things that we've come out with. Uh, strict mode will say, hey, you are not using the latest OPA features. We're gonna deny this. This is helpful as you do the op op upgrade path for OPA, as you introduce new keywords, as you introduce uh, the new features. You wanna say, hey, make sure that this is using the latest, uh, the latest OPA stuff. Uh, so you turn on strict mode and it'll, it'll tell you that, hey, your policies are no longer uh, uh, going to be valid with the latest things. And then uh, we added OCI bundle uh, registry support for, for, for downloading uh, uh, or storing bundles uh, with the OCI product protocol. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to it over to do a little gatekeeper intro and project update. Thank you. Uh, that was a great, thanks for all the updates in OPA and I know uh, as a Rego user, those definitely help the, the Rego authors. Thank you. Um, so my name is Rita. I am a maintainer on the OPA Gatekeeper project. I know this is KubeCon after all, so y'all probably wondering, how do I use this in, uh, for my Kubernetes clusters? Well, uh, we have a project called OPA Gatekeeper. It's a customizable Kubernetes admission webhook uh, that really helps your organization to enforce policies uh, and strengthen governance. Uh, what does that mean, right? So uh, in any large organizations, you know, you have the different personas, you have people who write the policies, you have people who enforce the policies, you have the cluster operators, and you also have people who are just trying to deploy their workloads in, you know, from their CI, CD all the way to production. So this is the solution that can help all these different personas and sort of create that separation of concerns where by your policy authors can write the regos, can think about what are the logic for actually validating uh, the resources that get to deployed in production are actually, uh, in, uh, are actually uh, um, according to uh, your in enterprise or your company's policies. Uh, and then as a developer, um, you then also just need to focus on, I am I following uh, the right uh, best practices, right? Uh, you know, things like container limits, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, unique uh, ingress uh, host names, stuff like that. Um, so again, this is to separate the, the folks who, who are actually writing the policies and the people who are enforcing and rolling these out in your enterprise, as well as the people who are just trying to make sure that they're doing, uh, following the best practice and making sure that their stuff is going to run well in production. Um, so I did uh, fo focus this talk a little bit on mostly on updates. So I'm going to try my best uh, for the uh, you know newer folks to kind of talk a little bit about the different functionalities. Um, so I guess real quick, um, a gatekeeper is uh, for validating. Um, uh, it, 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 it works as a validation as well as mutation. Um, and it also comes with audit. So uh, think about, you know, trying to introduce policies into your organizations. Uh, how do you make sure that before you even roll it out in enforcement mode, how do you get an audit to kind of see, hey, how are the uh, work for workloads doing by introducing a policy? Am I going to break people, right? So this is why uh, Gatekeeper has different enforcement 
uh, enforcement actions, thereby when you introduce a policy, it starts with audit and then, it, and then you turn on warning. So you warn the people when they uh, deploy their, their workloads. Uh, and last, when you feel it's safe, that's when you, uh, that's when you turn on the uh, enforcement uh, as deny, uh, and that's how you get, you block the, val uh, sorry, that's how the validation webhook blocks the deployment. Uh, so, so yeah, so the updates um, that are coming in uh, in Gatekeeper currently, uh, you know, we upgraded to OPA 044 uh, to leverage the latest and greatest. Um, and also in, now it's compatible with uh, Kubernetes 125. Um, you know, in the past it, it worked with PSPs, but now it works with PSA. Um, so definitely great to move uh, to, to that standard. Uh, and also mutation was in beta, and now it's stable. So if you're using uh, Gatekeeper v310, uh, you can definitely uh, rest assured mutation is going to work for your production workload. Um, and then we also introduced three uh, new features that are currently in alpha state, um, and validation of workload resources, external data, uh, and then we also have a Gator CLI that you can use as part of your CI CD pipelines. I will talk about these three in more details in a bit. Uh, and then you also have the ability to validate sub resources uh, and then metrics, right? Um, you know, getting the violations as part of your metrics solution, whether, uh, you know, that's uh, audit for last run in time metric or ask support for open senses as well as stack drivers. Um, and then last but not least, uh, allow wildcard at the start and in for excluding namespaces. I know a lot of uh, users have been asking for this to ensure that uh, their policies would not, uh, would exclude certain namespaces for, from the, the enforced policies. Uh, so yeah, and we, uh, we definitely care about performance a lot. So every gatekeeper release, uh, we are, we're constantly trying to reduce, uh, you know, audit and uh, the webhook memory footprint um, and uh, scaling, making sure that constrained violation limits are set uh, um, and reduced memory usage. Um, and then we also uh, introduced the defaulting the max serving thread to the go max prox. A flag uh, to ensure that CPU starvation and memory scaling is uh, introduced in the latest uh, gatekeeper release. Uh, and also reduced the request duration uh, when uh, policies are actually running for replicated data. So again, uh, think about in your cluster, you want to check uniqueness, and this is where you need to replicate the data to OPA cache. Uh, and we've ha had to do a lot to improve uh, the request duration so that uh, every request would take less time to get validated. Uh, and then also reduce CPU runtime. Um, and again, this is uh, when you need to add data to the OPA storage. All right, um, so I'm really excited to talk about this new feature. Uh, we got a lot of uh, users on GitHub asking, hey, uh, it's great that I see my pod is uh, failing certain validation. For example, a container doesn't have limits, right? Um, but I really would like to see that at the uh, deployment level, right? So this new feature called uh, validation of workload resources basically does that. Uh, it rejects the uh, workload resources when uh, that actually creates the resource that violates a constraint. Um, again, this is, think about your deployment, think about replica set or jobs, right? So you get an early detection of, hey, uh, the resources that are created from the, the pot templates are actually failing, right? Um, and then also uh, with this, um, you can also see this in your audit results, right? Uh, think about uh, deployments where the replica set is zero, right? You can still get a uh, violation that says, hey, your deployments are actually failing. And when that replica uh, increases more than zero, this is where the pods are going to fail, right? Again, early detection. Uh, here's an example. And as you can see, uh, does this have a, uh, this one? Yeah. Okay. All right. And as you can see, here's an example. Oh, I have to point that. Oh, okay. Um, as you can see, this is a new custom resource called expansion template. And this is where you specify, hey, for these 
um, you know, pod templates, uh, the generated resources pod, and for the actual deployment that you deploy, uh, it actually generates the, the pod that is the resource that we want to validate. Um, and as you can see, when you apply this um, deployment that, as you can see, doesn't have any uh, container limits, it would actually fail. Um, and again, it would tell you exactly why it's failing. Uh, the mission webhook failed uh, denying this request because the con container uh, resource limit is not provided and therefore denied, right? So again, early detection. And this has been a feature that the community has been asking for a while. Um, and the next feature I'm really, really excited to talk about is called external data. Um, again, imagine in any organization, you probably have data that doesn't actually sit on the cluster, right? Uh, so think of scenarios where, um, you know, you, where you need to, your policy to communicate uh, to systems outside of the cluster. Uh, and it, this is much more secure than the HTTP send uh, function in Rego. Uh, in out of the box, you can pat you can you can uh, batch your requests natively, um, and uh, think some scenarios that you can think of are you know uh, you know how to LDAP like how do you validate if the user that is making the request is actually at the, in the allowed list right or another one that is very very dear to our heart is uh, I want to be able to check for CVE vulnerabilities before the the container image actually starts running in the cluster, right? Again, where does that data live? Well, it lives in probably in some scanner tool solution that sits outside of the cluster. Um, and then another one, I, I actually don't have it here. Oh, no, I do. Image signature, right? So think about nowadays everybody's signing their images, but how do you validate and making sure that is the image uh, that you that's come that's signed by your org organization, right? And and that is what external data feature allows us to do, uh, and an, avail an ability to extend um, the policy engine to talk to uh, external uh, sources. Uh, and this also works with mutation. So you could, you know, imagine talking to another system, maybe LDAP, that says, hey, here's the owner of my pod. Uh, uh, and it gets that information and stick it, it, it mutates it, the mutates the resource on, on the request. All right. Um, and we love, uh, you know, early detections and nothing says early detection than uh, making sure you get that validation as part of your CI CD pipeline, right? Um, so Gator CLI is relatively new, still alpha. Uh, it's in a lot of ways is kind of similar to ConfTest if you've used it before. Uh, Gator Verify is uh, the way that you can actually uh, used to unit test your policies, right? Test the, the regos, test the con constraint templates and the constraints before you roll it out to, to your uh, users. Uh, and then Gator Test is a way for us to, uh, the shift left where you can actually validate the, uh, you know, think about your Helm charts, right? Uh, your Kubernetes deployments, you want to be able to test them before they're even, even being pushed to your clusters. And you can do this right, you can use the CLI right in your CI CD. Uh, and Gator Expand uh, basically helps us uh, mock resources that are coming from the workload resources, like, again, deployment to pod. Uh, and for the brew users out there, we now have Gator as a, uh, that you can use to brew install. Yay. All right, uh, and here's an example of Gator. Um, as you can see, ooh, I don't think this is working. Oh, here we go. As you can see, uh, I have some uh, resources that I want to verify. Uh, and then all I need to do is run uh, Gator Verify. And then as a result, uh, my test suite basically says, hey, looks like your allow repo is not correct because these uh, YAMLs have uh, containers pulling uh, images from another um, uh, container registry, right? And then here, as you can see, expected uh, violations, you know, you got one violation. Why? Uh, because you're using uh, image tags that's latest and no one should be using latest, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, more demos and uh, again, this is to test uh, Kubernetes resources in CI CD. Uh, I'm just gonna skip ahead. 
Uh, and then also really exciting is now we have a, a, gator, a gatekeeper policy website that, that you can search through. And these are community maintained uh, gatekeeper policies that a lot of different companies have created and learned over the past few years. Really great website, definitely check it out. Um, and then we're also an artifact hub. Uh, so uh, again, uh, check that out if you want to implement this in your uh, organization. And uh, we're also on GitHub, uh, Slack. Um, so if you have feedback or issues uh, and just want to talk to the maintainers, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we have, I think, just a couple minutes for questions. Uh, all right, that hand went up quick. <laughs> or, uh, or, yeah. or run down. You can uh, talk to the mic. Oh, wait. He was first. I'll get you a second. Thank you. The, the, the validation of work rule resources is what we are looking for. It's really helpful. But a couple of questions. Uh, can can the validation happen at the deployment time, uh, so run time, not only just deployment? That's one question. Second question is, can I have the errors, like the you know, soft errors versus hard errors? Do we have that capability? Uh, and third thing is you mentioned dashboard. Kind of want to learn a little bit more about you know, how the dashboard works. Thank you. Three questions there. Do you want to take the first one? Uh, yeah, so Gatekeeper is an emission webhook. Um, so it only happens during emission time. Uh, and audit is one that's running continuously in the cluster. So not runtime. All right. A second question was, I think. Yeah. Um, can you expand what that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think by by software, you mean you you don't want you don't want the the error to actually block anything. You want it to just yeah like uh yeah that, that's available in regular OPA. I think it's available in Gatekeeper as well. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, Gatekeeper comes with uh, th at least three um, uh, enforcement actions. So it, when you define your policy, which we call constraint, it's just a CR. A custom resource, you can literally say, hey, I want this to be in warning mode, right? Or I want this to be in audit, uh, or, or I want this to be in deny mode. So by default, if you don't say anything, it's deny. Um, but we add a warning uh, and, and, and dry run uh, specifically for that purpose, right? Because we know people want to test and get data from the running clusters before you even introduce a policy. Because we all know policies can be very dangerous. <laughs> cool. Awesome. And what was the third question? Was there, was there a third part to that? Or that was, was that it? Oh, you mentioned okay. about dashboard? Yeah. Uh, do you mean the website? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, I mean, if you've been following Gatekeeper, Gatekeeper has a lot of libraries. And it's, it's it, on GitHub, it's just uh, open policy engine slash uh, Gatekeeper library. And this is where you can also contribute and add your own policies to share with your friends. Um, but yeah, we created a website specifically to make the search capability a little easier. Uh, and also, uh, as you can see, it comes with the, uh, the template, but also how you can install and deploy it to your cluster. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. For um, workload resource validation, does that support expanding nested resources? So for example, if I have a cron job that produces a job that produces a pod? Can it do multiple levels of expansion? Uh, I Yes. So similarly, as you can see, daemon set and replica set, right? So it depends on how you can totally write that. Uh, as long as the parent is in this list, it should be able to expand. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next question over here. Uh, one of your slides talked about open census and stack driver exporter uh, integration. So I just want to know the use case because, I mean, how do you enforce anything once the metric has already kind of told you what has happened? Right. Um, so metrics works a little bit like, um, I mean, like any metrics where you want to get the, the violations uh, as metrics, right? Or you could use the metrics as, you know, how is Gatekeeper running, right? Like, is it healthy or whatever? Um, so in essence, open census and stack drivers are just uh, various options where you can export that data out. Does that make, does that help? Um, yeah, is it possible to use OPA to sort of validate against external data? So, 
you build a policy and you may want to check for validation to something that's sort of an external lookup or something like that. Is that possible? Yes, that's exactly what this feature does. <laughs> Um, so imagine, again, I think some of the examples that probably will speak to you are, you know, image signature, right? You have the signature in your registry, but how do you validate them at the time of emission, right? Is that in Gatekeeper um, or both OCA and Gatekeeper? Uh, I can speak to Gatekeeper first. Um, so uh, we build this feature such that Ex, any external data provider can extend, right? So the, it, the extension points are not in tree, right? Anybody can write an external uh, plugin and that plugin will be able to do the reaching out and you know, communicate and grab the data and return it to uh, OPA, right? Or Gatekeeper and, and then Gatekeeper will give it to OPA and then OPA will then evaluate that response as part of the rego. All right, so anyone can write the plugins. And in fact, we have a reference implementation uh, for anyone who wants to go write this. And we have uh, some sample uh, external data plugins that uh, calls out to Cosign as well as Notary V2 to verify signatures. And I highly, highly recommend everybody do this in production. And on the vanilla OPA side, we have, uh, if it's a very simple call out, we have HTTP send. Uh, if you just need one quick piece of information, we don't recommend if you're doing like a ton of lookups this way, you'll get terrible network latency. Uh, if, you do need, if you do need a more tightly coupled integration, we have like the OPA SDK, so you can write something, or if you can build it right, we have a Go, uh, 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 you can compile it with Go and just write it right as part of your application to just connect the two things together. Um, is the audit action available to non-gatekeeper, like regular vanilla OPA? Yeah, so uh, with, with the audit features, we, we do have a set of audit capabilities uh, built into just the, the Go OPA uh, binary. So you can do uh, a lot of those features depending on exactly how you want to audit and what you want to do. Cool. And question back there? Yeah, all good. I need the exercise. That was a great talk, thank you. Um, I went to a talk earlier in this conference about CEL and kind of how some of this functionality is kind of being put into the control plane itself. And so kind of what are your guys' thoughts, I guess, as contributors to this project, which obviously was a big part of that, and how do you think about this moving forward? I've been waiting for this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the good news is, you know, we all recognize uh, Kubernetes emission webhooks are just, they have a problem on, on its own and, um, and the community is working very, very hard to try to solve those problems. Uh, and, and I think, um, and, and just so you know, I'm in SIGAUTH um, and uh, you know, the, the cell cap, uh, you know, I, I reviewed it uh, uh, and there are people in the gatekeeper community who also is part of that, uh, that feature that's being added to Kubernetes. Um, so rest assured is uh, we have folks who are actively working on it all uh, uh, to think about how to integrate these different solutions together to make the policy management experience better for the community. Cool. Thanks for the question. And please give us your feedback. Uh, do we have time for more questions? Okay. I think that's it. Uh, thank you for all the questions. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you.